Firefly Aerospace successfully landed their small lander for the CLIPS program for NASA, and we couldn't be happier about it. So, Mike, I assume you, you stayed up to watch it. So, what? Um, it did not tip over this time, right? Like, because the it first one tipped tip over, over, right? And yes, the first one tipped over, and that was the Intuitive Machines Lander, which is coming up uh, their second one in a couple of days. This was the first oh, no, one from totally Firefly. Right. This is the first you're one from Firefly. <laughs> there are so many lunar landers. I got them confused. You're we totally got a right. Fleet yeah. Right now, it's amazing. I know. <laughs> Nothing on the moon for like ever. And all of a sudden, all at once, like three different things going out to the moon. <laughs> it's amazing. For fireflies, though, it's a short and stocky one. It's about six and a half feet tall and about 11, a little over 11 feet wide. They were able to have that support that they needed in order to not tip over, even if they landed at an extreme angle. But something I was really impressed by is that during the landing, they actually had a couple of hazard avoidance maneuvers, which means that their uh, radar sensors detected that there was, you know, large boulders or just, you know, maybe a, a large dip or crate in a crater or something like that. And we're able to move a little bit in order to have a safe and successful landing on a flat surface. And so I'm really impressed with that. We unfortunately didn't get uh, live 4K video from them. They said they could have, but they wanted to make sure since this was their first attempt that they had the strongest amount of telemetry that they possibly could so that they could do things like those ha hazard avoidance maneuvers and land successfully. So wait, wait, I'm going to give you two notes. First off, hazard avoidance maneuvers on the moon are here and after to be referred to as pulling an Armstrong, just so everyone knows. Uh, uh, and two, and two, I will, f I fundamentally, this is something that NASA got right back in the day is that they broadcast all of this stuff live and it doesn't need to be 4k 60 HDR, but you want to see it. And if you want to create excitement over these programs, you have to be able to see it. Video is telemetry too. And it's just as important and arguably it's the part that inspires humanity. So it's the thing that will help get your funding in the future. It's the thing that helps keep these programs going. They should not have underestimated the importance of live video from the moon, in my humble opinion, as a video person. <laughs> Obviously, I'm biased. Obviously, I'm biased. But you you do. You see dividend. When you when you do this stuff live and you take – it's hard because it, video is just going to chew through bandwidth. Like the number of telemetry channels you can get in one video stream's worth of bandwidth is insane, right? But that video – people aren't going to remember the telemetry. The telemetry is not going to win the hearts and souls of people on yeah. planet Earth. The you know, when will. Perseverance when Perseverance yeah. landed on Mars, they had multiple cameras that were recording. And obviously, bandwidth from Mars is not something that's going to allow us to do any kind of like live video at all whatsoever, right? Um, but it was one of the highlights of the press conference a couple of days later, where they ended up showing those cameras, where they showed uh, the cam <clears throat> the camera that recorded the parachute deployment um, where they showed the camera that was on top of uh, the actual sky crane looking down at Perseverance as it was lowered. They had the camera that was on Perseverance looking up to see the sky crane as it was lowered and syncing all that together and releasing that together and just blowing everybody's minds. That's the, to, that was the thing that I remember when, when Perseverance landed that everybody was talking with me about. It wasn't, wow, we landed another rover. Wow, the sky crane worked the second time. It was, wow, did you see that video? And I wanted to ask, actually, if they've uh, released like any like panoramas of the landing site yet or not. Because if you do, we can actually look at the surface in the local landing site and be able to figure out what those hazard avoidance maneuvers might have been for because you know we don't know if they're for boulders or for craters or other things like that but you know in the case of pulling an arm so oh yeah okay well there's a photo this is an awesome photo that they returned that is its shadow, obviously, um, but what an awesome picture that they were able to return of, of that. So you can see that if there is a little bit of small craters and dips nearby, so it might not have necessarily been a boulder, but more of like, oh, hey, one of the legs is going to dip into that and we're going to have it, we're going to be in a bad position, so... We look at an image like this and we don't have any reference points for how big stuff actually is. That's always the hardest problem of looking at images from landers or like from the Apollo missions is that you really don't have like, a, you don't have like trees or houses or other things around to tell you how big that is. So that crater, um, you know, that its shadow is above could be sub something substantial in size. So 
Uh, I look forward to finding out from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter as to where it precisely landed. Well, here's another cool shot that they had from the the top of the lander. And, you know, again, it's only one angle, not a panorama view, but I don't see a whole lot of boulders around. But in any case, uh, for this landing near Mer- Mericrisium, they have certainly done a great job. They did take video. They do have video of this that is in the process of being being back. So I've been refreshing the Firefly uh, page, hoping that they would have that before we went live. But that's OK. Uh, there, in fact, there was an experiment that was angled at the, the, the engines to see how much of a dust plume would would come out of the the landing spot as they were getting closest down so at the very least they want to make sure to return that video slightly different angle than we might be used to but still providing valuable data from that so at some point soon we they will they should be releasing some video um if not at least taking a little bit of video while they are on the surface now so uh expect that in the in the future well, hang on. I'm also confused because they're marking their altitude as above AGL, above ground level, right? But the only other version that I'm aware of would be MSL, or like I think it's median sea le- mean sea level. So, yeah, but there's no sea on the moon. So, what? <laughs> what is the? I don't understand. Sea of tranquility <laughs> doesn't count. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, help me help help me understand that, Jared. Like, yeah. To kind of answer like why are they using AGL? Like why would you even think about a mean sea level on something like this? But is there even such a thing as a lunar mean sea level? Um, so we do this basically we take the highest point on a planetary body and then the lowest point on a planetary body, and then what's the middle between those two? Voila! There is sea level on this <laughs> on this planet. That actually is really interesting and a really awesome problem to have because this means that as humanity starts exploring and going out into the stars, our old nomenclature of mean sea level will have to be up, well, should be updated so that we have a new nomenclature, so a a new, new verbiage to describe exactly what's going on. It'll be the same thing, but, you know, enhanced for humanity's journey into the stars, which I think is a pretty cool problem to have. Yeah, I feel like maybe MTL, like mean topographical level, might be a good uh, a good replacement for it, but also like it, maybe- This is why, MEL, no, no, Jared, you're- Mean, mean <laughs> Jared, elevation you're clear, level. Clearly, no. <laughs> no, you're clearly an astronomer. You want to you name it like some sort of number that no one will remember. <laughs> I can't help it. Careful, I'm Jared. Sorry. Your astronomy is coming out. Your astronomy is showing, I'm Jared. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll go back. Uh, I'll... Back to Firefly. Um, they landed successfully. They pulled in Armstrong, which is very impressive when you think about it, right? Like It's, it's mm-hmm. like autopilot, but for the moon. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, where are we at right now? Like, uh, what, are, what are our next milestones? So they are going to be uh, able to operate for the next 14 days or one lunar day, and they are going to get to work as soon as they can to deploy some of the other uh, instruments that they have on board. They have a drill that's going to drill um, about uh, three meters deep, and it looks like it has a, a bit of an angle on it. So even though the lander is stationary, that drill might be able to move a little bit to take a couple of samples, even though, you know, right in the same area, it can still take multiple samples. They also have a instrument they call the planet vac which is a really interesting thing how do you get a vacuum in a vacuum so what it's going to do is it's going to give a puff of air to blow dust around that is then going to be captured into their vacuum collection system to analyze some samples from that Um, one of the experiments that i'm most excited about is called an eds a uh, electrodynamic dust shield uh, which is creating a, a electrical charge to mitigate some of the dust collection and and if that experiment works, they are going to try their dangest to put that on just about everything for not just lunar missions, but potentially Mars missions in the future as well. But that could be a really, really cool system to have to even on spacesuits, your visors, cameras to be able to get the dust to clear off of it. And that way, too, we might be able to have missions in the future where we can land near a lunar base or a Martian base and not be several miles away to prevent dust from accumulating near that base. We could have systems like that to be able to clean stuff off. Anyway, I think that experiment is super cool. They are also looking at the uh, magnetosphere of Earth and looking at um, the 
electrical field that uh, s- surrounds the earth. I'm really excited about that one as well. Um, and then I, um, that's kind of the only ones I'm remembering that I'm, I'm trying not to mix up the experiments that are going on the intuitive machines lander. Cause there's some exciting ones on that one as well. I want to touch on, hang on. You mentioned dust. I want to touch on that for a moment. Cause that's really important and not something that we talk a lot about, um, like in aerospace, lunar regolith is nasty, nasty stuff. It's like, it, think of it as like razor sharp sand. Right. And so you're breathing this stuff in. Uh, when, you know, you, you go, you know, front, you're doing a lunar walk, you're outside and then you come in and you're going to, you're going to bring some of this lunar regolith in with you. It's going to get stuck on the seals of all of these airlocks. You're going to end up breathing it in. So any opportunity we have to like blow this stuff off or get rid of it before it traverses into spaces. Now, what you're talking about isn't exactly that, but still getting it off of cameras, off of lenses, lunar regoliths is, is insane. And get it off this the door is be to pre- your airlock. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. This is going to be something we're going to want. I don't know about you guys, but like Mars is neat, but like I, I want to go to the moon first. <laughs> like I want to see an earth rise. Like uh, uh, I'll take a two week trip, you know, a couple years out of my life is a different commitment, but like a two week vacation to the moon. Okay. So like having figured out, like being able to figure out lunar regolith and you know, how to, how to make sure that the seals are good and I'm not breathing this in and ripping my lungs apart and like, you know, all of that fun jazz is going to be important if we want to send hum- humanity to the moon more than just like onesies, twosies. And that was something they were really worried about too in the Apollo program of breathing that stuff in and getting too much of it on their suits. And they were tripping around quite a lot on those missions. So it was definitely a problem. It still is uh, something that is considered a, a, a hazardous issue that has not quite yet been mitigated um, because there's, uh, it's regular, it sucks to breathe in. You know, the, uh, the Apollo astronauts that did, missions that landed on the moon noted that basically as soon as they opened the hatch uh, between the lunar module and the Apollo command module after redocking after landing everyone you know first of all the two astronauts on the moon already were having allergic reactions to it and then the command module pilot uh, as soon as they opened that hatch you know within a couple hours was having allergic reactions to it as well so it is it is not good for you to be breathing in. And then there's also things like the metals in it as well that you really shouldn't be breathing in. And it's just really, really nasty. You know, you just, if in the grand scheme of things, when it comes to regolith, just don't. Like, just do not. Just <laughs> so, <don't>. <laughs> And <laughs> it would chew through parts of the Apollo suits as well. So even today, with, with today's technology, it's going to be one of the most significant challenges is making sure that regolith doesn't wreck everything that you bring with you. Absolutely. I don't know that this experiment is actually going to fix any of those things, but it's a step in the right direction, right? We got to start somewhere and this feels like a good starting point. I do have a quick correction to make. Uh, Joker XXX pointed this out. The drill cannot traverse only the one hole. And you're absolutely right. I was mixing it up with the drill that's going to be on the other lander that's uh, going to be landing, the Intuitive Machines one. So that's my bad. It's uh, so, right. it's so great. It's so great that we have this problem. Like we're having a hard time keeping track of all of the different which lunar missions, which? right? Yeah, exactly. Like this is a great problem to have. It's absolutely a great problem to have. 